Get this, 11 to 1 weekdays on the Triple M Network. Well, it's myself, a man who once accompanied Kevin Rudd to a strip club, Tony Martin. That is absolutely false. We've got a man who attends regular teabagging workshops with Mr Rudd, Ed Cavalier. That is absolutely false as well. And pushing buttons from inside a crate, it's the leader of the opposition's own personal gimp, Mr Richard Marsland. Equally, absolutely <laughs> false. <laughs> OK. Jeez, it's warm in this suit. <laughs> it is. How do you talk through the zipper? I know. It's a challenge, but you can learn. Yeah, you guys must have got up and read the papers this morning. Yes. yes. So I got a call from the Rove officers. Rudd's been busted with strippers. We need 20 jokes by 10. <laughs> <laughs> I got up yesterday morning and just saw this on the front of your, uh, your Herald Sun in Melbourne. I had too much to drink. I apologise. An exclusive by Glenn Mill. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, he's written his own story up. Now he's your bloke who uh, got a bit pushy at the at the yeah. journalism awards. That's wasn't the he? thing about this story is you're going. It's been written by Glenn Mill, mm. and he's written a story about Kevin Rudd being taken to a strip club mm. by Col Allen, who was the editor of the Daily Telegraph for about ten years. There you go. So where exactly is the moral authority here? Well, no, Telegraph. <laughs> Sure, we took him there and I'm a pisshead, but how bad's that Kevin Rudd? <laughs> the other thing they brought up yesterday was, oh, who knows how his teenage boys are going to react to this. i got a fair idea <laughs> how his teenage boys are going to react to the fact... Did you get pictures, dad? Yeah, Dad? Man, what, are did, pictures? what did they feel like? Oh, man, did they rub up against you? <laughs> but anyway, I've got my hands on some audio of yeah. an even more shocking incident between Kevin Rudd and a stripper. Hi, this is Warwick Kappa. Ah. You know, my long blonde look. Ah. Wearing tight shorts. Ah. How's that? Too cute by half. Gee, thanks a lot. Well, there you have it. <laughs> okay, we've talked about Mr Rudd. What about the Prime Minister? What's he been up to? Mm. He's identified a new source of energy and a new source of export dollars for Australia. I can inform the, the member that we would only supply uranium to India for peaceful purposes. I think uh, many Australians would find it rather strange on reflection that this country might sell uranium to China, but not sell uranium to India. <laughs> uranium? Where are we getting this uranium from? He's been talking to George Bush about his nuclear weapons too much. Nuclear weapons. <laughs> Well, it's a scam, isn't it? They're going to open it up going, yay, uranium. Well, I'm sorry, it's not. It's uranium, <laughs> yeah. which is just tofu that I've uh, poured barbecue sauce on. Best of luck trying to power something with that, guys. Where do you think we should export the uranium? Bolivia, is it? <laughs> Bolivia. <laughs> Thank you, Travis. Wow. Uranium to Bolivia. Yeah. Yeah. It's on the periodic table. Ooh. You'll find. Uh, when he was making that speech, he identified a great organisation I wasn't aware of. Check this out. One of the conditions that would be involved if sales were to take place would be the negotiation of inspection arrangements with the international uh, agency, the IEAE. <laughs> wow, the IEAE. IEAE. Do you remember when you had uh, Commando comics when you were a kid yeah. and it was the war in the Pacific? And whenever a Japanese soldier would be stabbed with a bayonet, they'd always say... Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> That's what they say every time. <laughs> what else is Batman going? hit someone this morning. Yeah. Oh, what did it and say? And up on the screen it said flump. <laughs> <laughs> flump? They had a few aye, aye, aye's too. Batman. Who was the bad guy? Shandell. Liberace. Oh, nah. You are down the arse end of the series. Oh, my goodness. Liberace just playing himself, basically. Liberace playing himself <laughs> and playing his wise guy gangster, identical twin brother, oh, Harry. Yeah. Oh, and the fact that Liberace was trying to put people through a, a musical mincing machine. None of this was as far... I know, a musical mincing machine. That was his nickname, I believe, for many years. <laughs> he was unmarried while he was touring. <laughs> but none of this, none of this was as believable as... They had three girlfriends for Liberace I and know. he had to pretend that he was into them physically. He couldn't bring himself to touch any of them. Even his evil brother wasn't having a bar of them. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Anyway. The same paper uh, is running a picture of Shane Warne in Lederhausen. Oh, oh geez. It, That's like you on our website. <laughs> it certainly does. He's copying my look. Shane Warne and his ex-wife Simone. As the caption says, as they might look as German citizens. <laughs> Holding a beer stein, wearing Lederhausen. <laughs> That's one of our most respected newspapers right there. Well done.
Shane Warne is he might look as a German. Because what's the deal here? He's going to Germany to become a German citizen so he can play cricket in England, something like that. Apparently. I'm trying to work out an invading Poles joke, but I can't quite yeah. get to it. Mm. And what would be strange is, you know, if you go to Germany <laughs> as Mr. Warne, of course, you get to Germany, your hair worn. That's right. And then when you go back to England, you're Mr. Worn and you lose the hair. And There's uh, only one thing that really worries me, and that's hair loss. <laughs> hair worn? My apologies. No, 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 mate, it's fine. It's from the Advanced Hair Studio. It's all plugged. <laughs> Our co-host for this hour is Alan Ruck. Hello, sir. Alan, thanks for coming in. Thanks, thanks for having me. Now, no offence, uh, if people don't know your name, they certainly know you as, well, you're always described as Ferris Bueller's sidekick and Ferris Bueller's day off. Are you happy with, uh, you know, that description? I can live with it for an hour. <laughs> All right. <laughs> because we have got a lot of Ferris Bueller mania in this country. Is it odd to you that you can come halfway around the world to present a film that was made 22 years ago and people are still going nuts for it? It's a little surreal, you know, <laughs> but, but people are pretty nice. I haven't been scared yet. So, Well, Richard Marsden may do that because he was telling us off here that he actually based his clothes on Ferris Bueller for a well, few I've years. I've got to say, the fashion still holds up from that film and so does the music, but the Detroit Red Wings top that you wear, the red and white one, was so cool when I, when that movie, I, I loved it so much and yeah. I couldn't find one in Australia. When I first went to America, that was one of my first points of business was picking up a top like Cameron wears. <laughs> Did you still have it? <laughs> yeah, I should have maybe brought it in and worn it, but that would have been a bit of a freak out, right? <laughs> I might have been scared, <laughs> so I'm grateful. And as Richard pointed out, it is called Ferris Bueller's Day Off, but your character is kind of the guts of it, isn't it, really? Yeah, well, he, he's the one with the, with the drama. He's the one with yeah. the dilemma. He's the one that's uh, troubled, and he's the one that sort of needs to get fixed. You yeah. know? He, he, so it's his journey, really, and, and, and uh, Ferris is sort of the magician who's pulling all the strings and making it happen. And this was a movie that just brought the house down in cinemas. I'm old enough to remember it at the theatre. People loved it. Was there any sense when you were making it that this was uh, going to be something good? Well, I had a great time making it. I had a great time. Matthew and I were already friends. We had done a Broadway show together for nine months, and then we went into the pictures, so we were pals. We didn't have to make that up. You right, know? right. Uh, Hughes gave us a lot of leeway in sort of improvising and just running with things, you know, so we had a good time making it, but I had no idea. that. It, <laughs> no, I just thought it was a nice job, and, you know, we'll see what happens. And when I saw the first rough cut, I was horrified, and I was like, well, I'm young. I, I can learn to do something else, uh, you know. Well, what had you done? Had you done many films before that, I think? Uh, a handful. Yeah, just a few. I actually played Sean Penn's stupid friend in um, a movie called Bad Boys. Yes, not the more recent Bad Boys. No, no, no. It was it was the Sean Penn Bad Boys of, of like 1983 Is or something. Is that the one where he's on the, on the video cover kind of Fight Club style? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's about he's... to take a swing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He and Isai Morales are, are mortal enemies and they wind up in a, juvie to, a juvenile prison together <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and they beat the hell out of each other. Fantastic. That, that, yeah. Hang on, I know what I'm thinking of. Weren't you in class? Were you in class? Uh, I was. That was, Bad Boys was the first movie I did in class was the second one wow. I did. Yeah. Because class ran for about a year and a half in New Zealand. Popular. It was the first MILF movie, I think. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who? Yeah. What was your role in that? Were you? Um, idiot, <laughs> idiot child. Uh, I think my name was Roger, but I really don't remember what happened. I was in that movie, and you know, I always looked younger uh, th than I was. You know, so I was actually in my twenties when I made that movie. Right, and, right. And, and John Cusack, that was his first movie ever, and he was ten years younger than me. <laughs> you know, and we were playing the same age. You know, so that was that's really what I remember about that. These movie. are real video shop movies. Yeah, and they're up the back. Ed worked at a video shop for years uh, yeah, was Ferris Bueller on the stolen list off oh, as soon as it came in the door you, you, you get two copies you'd put one on the shelf and then just hand one to a teenager that was going to steal it anyway <laughs> it really just cleared things up you would right. put it out they'd walk in here's yours sir and here's the one for all right. the time, time honesty is the best policy Absolutely you're going right. to steal this anyway so just go just take it now <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean right, save yeah. us all the trouble of putting stickers on it you know <laughs> <laughs> always now, Star Trek fans are listening who have we got is Matt Parkinson from the Melbourne Cage on the line you there Matt yeah, g'day everyone, how you going? Hey, hey. Okay. G'day, g'day Alan, thanks for being on our show today. You oh, my pleasure, remember. how are you? The listeners, I'm great mate, the thing is I'm a bit worried because I've, I'm downstairs in my car just about to leave work and I've found myself parked behind the car that you showed up in, yes. uh, which was driven by the boys from the Astor Theatre and in the back windscreen of that car they clearly have Star Trek Starfleet insignia sticker. <laughs> 
I, I yeah. see. And what does it, this doesn't bode well on the street? No, it means you're traveling with Trekkies, mate. <laughs> oh, right, but we're not going to be like you know beset by ruffians or anything, are we? Well, no. Although you should worry, there is quite a significant Klingon population. Yes. Here, so oh no. Be aware of that. But the thing is, how many of you traveled in the car, Alan? Okay, there were four of us. Okay, well, when you get in the car to leave, it's important, just before they turn the key, it's important that you say, stand by to transport four. <laughs> All right. All right, will do. Very important. All right, I'll remember that. I'm writing it down. Okay. okay. Make it so. Thank, Thank you, you, Parker. Matt. Cheers, Parker. Hello, everyone. Cheers. On that fine show, we've had so many letters when people knew that you were coming in. Listen to this. This is from Jason Abdallah in Sydney. He goes... How could you forget to mention Alan Ruck's instrumental performance in the movie Speed? Does the quote, we're at the airport, I've already seen the airport, mean nothing to you guys? That man's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> you were one of the people trapped on that bus, weren't you, in Speed? I was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was. How long yeah. trapped on the bus for real? Uh, uh, oh, I think it was 10 weeks. Wow. On one bus or another. They had 13 different buses. Yeah. They had a bus that could be driven by a man up on the roof, and <laughs> wow. Sandy Bullock had a dummy wheel, you know, right. just, you know, so she could be pretending to drive and they had um, the one called the Pope Mobile that had this huge plexiglass uh, uh, cage uh, uh, welded to the front so the cameras could be there right. they had the bus that they jumped that was filled with dummies that was filled with people in our costumes you know yes. yeah yeah but he actually jumped that thing about 50 feet at about 6 or 7 feet in the air <laughs> wow yeah wow, that's yeah. yeah 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 and what was your passengers sort of characteristic what were you were you the whining we're all going to die passenger or were you the uh, I, I had I had a bit of that going on you know I, I was the tourist I was yeah. a guy from somewhere else <laughs> <laughs> and did um, you visiting uh, LA. make it into the second one where they were on a a very unswift boat. Uh, I, I, yeah, no, I was. Um, that I had just scored um, Spin City, right. and I, I went in to do um, some looping for Twister, some ADR oh, for right, Twister. Yes. And uh, Jan Deban said, "Alan, I have a part for you in Speed too." <laughs> and I said, I, "I can't. I'm going to New York to do this television show." He said, "You can't. You can't. We're going to be on a boat. It's going to be great." <laughs> Come on, you know, but I couldn't. So. But hang on. So some of the passengers from the bus did end up on the boat. Yeah, I think uh, that's yeah. quite a coincidence, isn't it? Really. Well, you know. <laughs> but I guess I can help. Sorry. I just, Hollywood hell. Just oh, Only man. just occurred to me. One bad situation after another. I'm sure it's been observed that you do bear an uncanny resemblance to Edward Norton. You do. Yes, uh, yeah. Can't be denied. Well, you know, I, I was actually uh, in New York City, and I was uh, getting ready to audition for Michael J. Fox for Spin City, and I was still smoking cigarettes at that time, and so I'm down in the street smoking a cigarette, <laughs> and this guy walks up to me and goes, you are great! <laughs> and you know, I'm like, well, thank you. I, uh, thank you. And he said, God, oh my God, you were so great. You were so scary. Wow. You know, and I couldn't figure out what he was talking about because I was Ferris kind of, Bueller. I, no, no, no. He, 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 he said, "What a creepy character!" And I was getting ready to come out and twist her, which I was like one of the goof troop. You know, I was like one of the one chasing tornadoes and stuff. And I was like, "Well," he said, "What a picture! What do you think?" And I said, "Well, there's you know, there's really good special effects." And he looked at me like I, you know, I had three heads. He said, "I just saw you in the picture last night, the Richard Gere picture." No, oh, primal and, and I said, fear. Uh, "Yeah, yeah." I said, "I've I've never been in a Richard Gere oh. picture." And then the guy walked off, and I, you know, so see, this is one thing. As an actor, I thought, well. You know, not really a leading man. No. You know, uh, a character actor, but, you know, nobody else really looks like me. So, you know, <laughs> and then this guy comes along. Not only does he look like me, but he's like Academy Award material. You know, but and it's a little agitating. Surely it's only a matter of time where you and Ed Norton are brothers. Surely that's going to happen. Ooh. Well, you know, that's pretty much up to Edward. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I don't think, you know, if I put it out there, uh, I think they're going to think of you other know, things to do. Hello, Jill. How are you? I want to know why you weren't cast as Shaggy in the Scooby-Doo movie. Oh, that's... Because you... Had, I had your face in my mind when they were doing that, and they cast some other idiot. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Is that well, a compliment to you, do you uh, think? I, I love it. And, um, it was I, a huge compliment to you, Alan. Sorry. Thank you. Very sweet. And and I think the, the thing was that um, I got a little long in the tooth, yeah. as they say, because no. they were supposed to be like... Nutty twenty-year-old yeah. Scooby Doers, and I was. Um, you don't look much older. advanced. You could still play a nutty yeah. twenty-year-old. Yeah. You don't look much <laughs> older than the bloke you did with the guy from Scream, Matthew Lillard. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Lillard. Yeah. I'll get you next time, Lillard. Oh, thank well, you're you. great. Thank you. What are you doing, Mr. Well, Cavalier? You're not going to embarrass our guests with photos from Borgus. I, I am. We have theme months here. We had Capril, uh, encouraging people wear capes to work, send oh, in yeah. a photograph, win oh, a crap yeah. prize. Uh, <laughs> we're now in August. And people wanted Norgus. <laughs> no, that, what is that? I don't know. I'm getting scared. It's to do with breasts, Ellen. Yes, Just move we, on in. We couldn't do uh, that. But instead, one no, of I got the legs, but nothing I going know. on up the stairs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, but then, but instead, we've gone for Borgist. Now, the idea being that the uh-huh. listeners dress up as the Borg poorly, mind you, and win. Get this, remote controlled helicopter. Dang. Yeah. Now you've been in Star Trek. You know what the Borg <laughs> looks like. Describe what you're seeing there. <laughs> There's like um, four giant nipples with cables attached to them, um, sort of uh, uh, attached to a man's face. Brilliant. And he's the front runner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Meet our listeners, Alan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, yeah. you know, you're leaving out the big news because you know what we celebrate every year here in Australia? What's that? Rucktober, isn't it? It's absolutely right. This man, people just go nuts for Alan Ruck for a whole month. Stations base their promotion. What am I doing here now? <laughs> You've come early. I'm a little early. We're mm. saying... Have you been involved in a shameful incident from your past that you've been keeping to yourself? Maybe now's the time to get it out of your system. Mm. A Rudd-style incident. I think I've mentioned this in the press a few times. I don't think I've mentioned it on the show. I disgraced myself in 1985 at the uh, Goldie Awards in Brisbane. Sorry, on the uh, Jupiter's, in fact, it was. Ooh. On the coast. Ooh. Can't even remember. Well, what happens? How off my nut apparently was. <laughs> 21 years old. Working at FM 104 in Brisbane, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. now Triple M, mm-hmm. won some awards for some ads we'd done Great. for thinking about carpet collection, I think oh, it was. Yeah, it's, it's and still thinking carpet. We're at the uh, yeah the Goldie Awards, Radio Industry Awards on the Gold Coast, and we were winning every second award. Mm-hmm. And so what would happen is another bloke would get up. He was winning every second. He, we were winning the odd numbers. He was winning the even numbers. This bloke normally won all the awards, oh. so he wasn't very happy with us. And he gets up and says that uh, my producer, very fine Queensland radio legend, Ian Shaw Smith, oh. had stolen all of the ideas for the ads from a uh, one of those tapes they put out of award-winning ads from overseas. Your idea. So I was 21. I'd never been to a casino before, and I was completely off my nut. <laughs> yeah. So I got up and uh, used a fair bit of foul language, <laughs> apparently, distributing... F and C's, like they were going out of business. All I remember is just waking up in a chair with a queue of elderly people from Queensland country radio stations going, you will never work again in this state. Oh, oh no. You foul-mouthed young man. You'll never work in Innisfail Radio again. But, wow. And all I was trying to do was defend uh, Ian mm-hmm. from these accusations of plagiarism, but nobody remembers that. All I remember <laughs> is the F and C's. Wow. You just have a round of booze. Give me a round. Fully deserved. Disgraceful. Sorry to anyone who was there and had to witness it. But what happened was, over the years, the story has just become more and more exaggerated. Until? So, it, recently, I bumped into Mark Irvine, who's, a, well, an FM radio announcer. Mm-hmm. He'd been up in Queensland. He goes, mate, what did you do at the Goldies at 85? <laughs> I'm going, well, everyone's heard the story, haven't they? He goes, apparently you punched out Billy J. Smith and tried to set fire to Wickedy Whack. <laughs> How did it get to that? <laughs> Try to pu- who would try and punch out Billy J. Smith? No, me. me He's me. fallen over. He's fallen over. You'd have to give himself one. <laughs> and how exactly do you set fire to, whack. to a bunch of comedy parodists? I don't know. Setting fire to Wickedy Whack. Oh, were they wearing a lot of chiffon, were they? It's <laughs> pretty ambitious. How do you know it wasn't true? It could have been a Kevin Rudd style blackout. <laughs> you don't know what you got mm. up to. Well, that is the nearest I've got to a Rudd out. Uh, what about you, Mr. Marsland? You seem to be sitting on a lot of shameful well, incidents. Yeah, a shameful incident a few weeks ago, uh, giving a bit of a speech at my sister's 18th birthday party. Mm. Might have dropped the magic a couple of times. Oh, dear. <laughs> um, in the speech. What was your excuse? It was a mixed crowd. Oh, okay. Really? You know, and Smokers night. Uh, Sailors. And I accidentally, yeah. I mean, there was aunties and uncles, and so I apologise for that. Yeah. Really. Um, but Give yourself some booze. Of course, yes. Everyone gets booze in this segment. Um, but also, I was at the Edinburgh Comedy Festival in Scotland a few years ago. Oh, give yourself some more booze. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing there? Uh, my one-man show, so the booze are actually a bit of a reminder of the audience reaction. <laughs> um, but uh, and, That's quite a big crowd for Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Uh, uh, but uh, no, I would met a lovely uh, Irish uh, lass. Oh, hello. Finally. Who, uh, who told me that she would only give me a phone number uh-huh. if I uh, climbed up to the top of King Arthur's seat. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a gigantic hill yeah. in Edinburgh, but it was sort of an awards night or something. I had a suit on, uh-huh. and uh, I went up there and soiled my suit. 
uh, from the climb because I just couldn't make it. I was too drunken. It, it was torn. There was mud all over it. It wasn't action? soiled in the way that I would have oh, liked it to have been. Were you, did you get any action? No, no, none at all oh, because so I didn't make on. it to the top. I was so unfit. So when you meet a girl, yeah. what she says is, can you go as far away as possible yeah. to the top of a mountain? And when you get back, I'll well, give you my phone number. I was with her. She was jogging up and down. She was fine. Oh. <laughs> I was just a, a bleeding mess at the bottom. All like right. It. Is that shameful? I guess that's shameful. Yeah, shameful. Well, look, I'm, For you it is. I'm a pretty clean living guy, but yeah. how young is too young to push in front of someone at the supermarket? <laughs> See, there was a kid. He was pretty tall, though, for his age. <laughs> right. he was only for a four-year-old. <laughs> he was buying bubble gum or something, and he was flicking through a TV hits magazine, and he hadn't seen that it was time to move on. Cool. And I had my usual basket full of, you know, chicken off cuts and yogurt and Dick Smith bush frozen food. fruit and Dick Smith bush foods. And I thought, I'm going to take this opportunity. <laughs> Zipped right by him. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Cop, Cop that, hey? <laughs> Listen to your iPod the whole time. Fallout boy didn't tell you to... Be quick on the uptake, young man. These are shameful incidents. Mm. Listeners, surely you've got a few in the back pocket. Hello, Chris. Oh, I disgraced myself. Probably even worse than Kevin Rudd, I think. What have you done? One weekend, I uh, openly organised a Steven Seagal movie marathon. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. Set off our studio audience. <laughs> and, uh, Chris, did you watch Half Past Dead? Um, yeah, I did, actually. And I got... I got to watch uh, Half Past Dead 2, which has come out recently. It doesn't even have Steven Seagal in it. No. no. I heard about this. Who's playing the Seagal role? Uh, the old wrestler, Bill Goldberg. Goldberg. <laughs> <laughs> they can just slot an old wrestler into Steven Seagal's <laughs> pants now, can Sick they? Fucking banana. <laughs> Fantastic. Did, did I you? I threw on a uh, version of, I don't know if you've seen it, Van Damme's In Hell. Oh, yeah, I've heard about this one. What's yeah, that? Yeah, I tried to rely more on his acting than his fighting. Yeah. It doesn't work. Well, I think the title was <laughs> <laughs> fairly accurate. Wisely chosen. Audience in I hell. got one of the bananas in pyjamas to do a better job, I think. <laughs> well, you've won yourself a copy of The Late Show Presents, Bar mm-hmm. Just in the Olden Days. I uh, could also say hello to my girlfriend, Lisa. Oh, sure, sure. Oh, well, there you go. Is yep. she still your girlfriend after this confession? Uh, she's on uh, Tender Hooks here. Well, watch On Deadly Ground. That'll get her back. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> hello, Robert. How are you? Well, well, I was at a, um, a Bucks party down the casino on the Gold Coast about <laughs> 10 years ago. What a sentence. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what happened? <laughs> well, I was playing some roulette and a uh, big spender of me. I was just betting five bucks on red and black and uh, yeah. got a bit crammed in. I was watching the, the wheel spin. I started feeling a bit crook. Mm. And um, before I knew it, I just had to get out of there and it was too late. And I was pushed up against the perspex and ended up throwing up in the roulette table. Oh, fantastic. Oh, yes. I've gone all in. <laughs> <laughs> Put it all on carrot. How did it end? Did you... Still win something? Well, no. Before I knew it, security were just coming from everywhere and they just grabbed me and took me outside. And now uh, you're doing it as a live show at Jupiter's, I suspect, three nights a week. Uh, what, what happened on the craps table there? Uh, Akira, hey, Matt, how are you? Um, I tackled Humphrey B. Bear at a family day. <laughs> wow. Now, front on? Was it a front on tackle? Did he know you were coming? No, no, see, I don't know. I'd had a lot to drink and... Um, mm. Was he looking at you? I thought he was about to eat all the children that were following him or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> now, did you, uh, just to make it a fair fight, did you take your pants off as well? <laughs> no. no, but the, the worst shameful bit is I, the police chased me and some other guy started running with me for some reason and <laughs> we both got locked up and he got charged with the assault and when we were in the watch house, he's going, tell him that it was you. And I'm going, mate, you've had too much to drink. <laughs> you don't even remember what you did. <laughs> you've gone crazy, man. Get me out of here. This guy's a lunatic. We've had a few people through on this show, Ed, over the years, <laughs> over the two years, from the uh, your footy show down south, your James Brayshaw and the like. Your AFL yeah. footy show. We've not had anyone from the uh, other side of the fence, have we? Called Tone, the what footy show? Uh, is that the... It's three letters. The other one. I just called it the other one. <laughs> the NRL <laughs> footy. Oh, Matthew Johnson's here to help me Thank out. You. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. You haven't had Sturlo or Fatty <laughs> no, or the haven't. Chief. We haven't had Sturlo or Fatty yet, but I have pointed out that I, I've never forgotten an image. It's haunted me for years <laughs> of Sturlo painted up blue as a Smurf for some reason <laughs> on the yeah. footy show and just sitting there looking really unhappy. <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah. I think he's got a Smurf up again. He, really he has get, to. Get the blue paint back on mm. Sturlo. Mm. We oftentimes dress him up. But we, we used to have dress up shows and Sturlo mm. was always Yoda. <laughs> was he? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they're all the Smurfs. So. <laughs> he could do a good Glenn Wheatley, I've always you said. Think so? <laughs>
Glenn Wheatley. Yeah. Not much call for it at the moment. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> the moment. Look, enough about the footy show. I want to talk about the final window because uh, mm. I love movies. I don't know a lot about football, but something that always baffles me about this country is why aren't there more movies about football if everyone's into it so much? Great point. Isn't I can't it? answer that. Uh, one of the last great rugby league movies w- w- was made was Richard Harris, uh, A Sporting Life. Oh, that's a fantastic movie. Wakefield Trinity up in the north of England. And uh, one of the great scenes is that where he gets his jaw broken and his teeth are hanging. And as he's walking off the field, he grabs a fan uh, and gives her a big kiss on the lips. Shot about... Uh, 62, uh, yeah. 64. Yes. It's all in black and white. Black and white. And says, am I a good player? <laughs> <laughs> we try to get that into this movie. But, uh, they that, keep. that really is a great movie. And I noticed, though, it's one of those movies where the rugby scenes are fantastic. But because I'm assuming they're actors... It's chop, 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 yes. chop. And, you know, you've got to cut to make it look more violent than it is. How have you gone with your film, The Final Winter, with the footy scenes? How have they been achieved? Well, that's the most difficult thing. Is a, you know, you're pearling to a core audience who are rugby league fans and expect it to be, particularly from that era. That era during the late 70s, early 80s was brutality. Yeah, it was basically tough. catch and kill. Mm. Uh, and so what they did, Matt Nabel, who, who wrote it and stars in the movie, he just had his network of guys he played with, guys who were current players playing in the local you know, the local competition around the northern beaches of New South Wales and got them together, th- split them up, threw them a football for three days and said, boys, wind the clock back, just tear into one another. <laughs> and and they did. Uh, uh, we had guys who, uh, you know, rushed to hospital with uh, splits over their eyes, guys who uh, broke their ribs, a guy who broke his wrist, guys tore hamstrings, one guy did his knee. Uh, you know, they had a fighting scene where they basically had to get between them and, and split them up. So they really did justice. <laughs> Great footage. Yeah. Good footage. This is going to be an excellent commentary track. But it comes across, Tony. It is it's great. It is so bone-jarring, some of the hits that you see. Yeah, it's just incredible. quickly explain what the final winter is for people who don't know. Uh, it's based... Uh, of, of course, the AFL movie, uh, The Club, or the yes. old VFL movie, it, it's very similar to that. Just involved around uh, club politics. Why it appeals to rugby league is that rugby league during the late 70s, early 80s, as I said before, it was it was a very, very tough game. To be a star in those days, to make a name for yourself, you had to give more than you, you, yeah. you, 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 know, you took. It was... Uh, and all of a sudden, though, we got a, a, a chairman of, of the judiciary who came in, uh, uh, Jim Comins, and they decided that if this game was going to survive and get onto a bigger stage, they had to clean it up. So these great, tough, iconic men that were, you know, making a name for themselves and, you know, the great heroes of the game, all of a sudden, instead of getting two and three game suspensions for breaking guys' jaws, <laughs> we're getting 12 months suspension, 18 months suspensions, and they basically took their livelihoods away. So it, was, it sort of harks back to that era. What I love about your older football is, and, and if I got this right, in the old days, people had to have a proper job as well as playing football. Mm. That's right. <laughs> and uh, that is true. My, my father... Um, he used to play rugby league and work dog watch down the coal mine. So he would play a game of football on a Sunday, go and have uh, half a dozen to a dozen to a dozen and a half schooners <laughs> at the pub, and then go to work, work in a coal mine from midnight to eight o'clock in the wow. morning. And that's just what he did. And have you used any of him in your, your character? Well, my father was a, uh, a coach as well. And I remember one day, you know, very proud, said to a few of my mates, yeah, Dad's about to do the uh, the pre-game speech. We're going to have a listen. We're a, and I've never heard language like it. You know? my, <laughs> mine kid just said, your father swears a lot. <laughs> you should see him when he's angry. <laughs> now, I think you had may have had a little role in footy legends, correct? Yes. And yes. now you've but in this one, are you like second lead? Mm. Yeah. Is that right? Um, well... There's a few of us here. I look, I'm, uh, yeah, it's a, a team a, a, yeah, it's, a team. it's just part of a team. I couldn't do it without the forwards. No, but there's <laughs> Matt Nabel. He's the stub. We've got John Jarrett. Yes. Uh, Nathaniel yes. Dean. Yeah, yeah. And so it, it was fantastic. Myself and Matt Nabel had, before this movie, really had done no acting at all. Uh, he came and approached me one day at, uh, at the gym at, and came up and said, listen, I'm, uh, I've written a script. If I get it up, are you interested? And I went, yeah. Then he rang me and said, I think I've got it up. And I went... Shit. <laughs> I've got to do something. What are we going to do now? So, yeah, I, I should bring up, though, when uh, we were talking, you know, mate, that you were coming in 
yeah. today, Matthew. Richard said to me, he was looking at your Wikipedia entry, and he said, oh, yeah, yeah, no, we can talk to uh, Matthew about that World Cup that's coming up. He uh, he won one of those once. <laughs> said, Richard, uh, that might be Rugby Union you're yes. talking about there. Or... That was the Rugby League World Cup in 1995. Yeah. Yeah, now, Ed, yeah. I think, were you a Swan supporter at one point? Oh, yeah, back in the, uh, I was living in Sydney at the time. Mm. My mum's my from uh, Melbourne, one of your AFL states, so we would have to go every weekend, and it was... There was no one there, Matthew. As you know, it was diabolical. Harrowing. It was always raining. But I was taking some absolute screamers because uh, I used to sit behind the goal. One day I went up, got on my friend Oliver's shoulders, took a screamer, and then cracked a seat with my head when I came down. <laughs> that would have made their highlights. <laughs> it did, yeah, yeah. Once Dr. Eggleston pulled his thousands out, they were crap. <laughs> uh, but uh, I remember in 1993, we were playing a game at Newcastle, rugby league, of course, mm-hmm. playing a game. And... Uh, at the closing stages of our game, there was a bit of a break in play, and the uh, the ground announcer got on the PA and said, "Ladies and gentlemen, I've got an urgent message." <laughs> and everyone's got, oh, someone's died. The car's been like broken in it. And uh, I listen. And he goes, "The Swans have actually won a game," <laughs> and the crowd laughed. They'd lost twenty five in a row, and it just shows how far they've come now. It's, yeah, uh, it's really disappointing. <laughs> yeah. Now, something you said, Matthew, when we. Ronnie, just a moment ago, as you said, oh, I haven't done much acting. But hang on, what are you talking about? What about yeah. all your characters on the footy show? Reg they... Reagan, yeah. Reg, and what is uh, is he still, you know, kicking on? Yeah, he kicks on. I just use him sparingly. He just, he, but uh, yeah, he's still there. And he's a throwback to that 1970s era mm. of, uh, you know, my father. You know, Reg Reagan's politically incorrect. He, he mm. drinks a huge amount of alcohol, <laughs> smokes. He's a terrible womanizer. <laughs> and, uh, and and my father actually said to me one day, he goes, mate, I don't find Red Dragon funny. I said, because you are Red Dragon, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it strange, the stuff that just pops out? Your ne- I got on YouTube and with my young bloke and typing wrestling and WWE, and I actually found this, and you've got to have a, I, I found an interview on the Arsino Hall show. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And it was Arsino Hall, Morgan Fairchild, mm-hmm. and wait for it, Randy Macho Man Savage. Randy Savage. <laughs> Isn't it great that's been preserved for the ages? And uh, he was like, I'm going to break Hulk Hogan's neck. I'm sorry about that, Morgan Fairchild. <laughs> <laughs> you got to see it. It's brilliant. Sorry. I saw that. Ravishing Ric Flair uh, doing some signings uh, last year. Now, Ravishing Ric Flair must be in his 80s. Yes. And he's the Nature Boy or something. No, no, not yeah. Ra- yeah, the Nature, yeah, nature boy. boy. Right, so he yeah. has this call of like, woo, woo, or something along those lines. And he came out and he had two cups of tea took a sip of both, gave them back to the publicist because they weren't good enough, sat down to start signing something. One of the kids went, woo, woo. He pointed at an assistant and the assistant did the woo, woo back to the kid. <laughs> nah, we had him on our show, Rick, Rick Flair. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, um, and one of the guys, a big fella called Daryl Broman, he's quite a you know, good human guy, just made the passing comment, is that your real hair? Because it's like a Uh-oh. shocker. And... Oh, and he saw it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could tell he was a bit annoyed. And in the ad break, wanted to fight Daryl. Oh, <laughs> oh, <really>? Seriously, <laughs> assistant handed him a chair. Mate, I've used... got a. I've had some terrible luck in the past with wrestling. Mm. As a young man, I was a huge WWF fan. Of course, Who is WWE. Your favorite? Yeah, yeah. My favorite. Oh, uh, what's his name? Uh, of course, yeah. Everybody loved the Hulkster. Absolutely. You know, right. But then uh, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Oh, he was good. They used to say, "Why are you so big?" He said. <laughs> He used to say, I eat plenty of fish and chicken. And I say, what about all the rest of you inject into yourself, Ricky? And all. <laughs> but, um, but I used to absolutely love it. And I went to at Cessnock Services one night. They Ooh, had a yeah. uh, wrestling fiesta. And they had all the poor imitations. There was uh, <laughs> <laughs> there was uh, King Kong Kelly. Oh, yeah, right. There was a guy called George the Animal Harpez, right? <laughs> <laughs> and George the Animal Harpez comes out. He's standing on the ring apron. It's a tag team bout. And I'm 12 years old. And one of my mates... We're at the Cessnockic services, remember? We've got a big plate full of steaming hot chips and gravy. And he picks up a, a hot chip and throws it, and it lands on George the Animal Harpez's back. <laughs> so he turns into the crowd, and he's just off his head and looks, and the spotlight just goes straight onto me. And I'm thinking, I'm 12 years old, he won't do it. So he comes down to me, he says, get in the ring. <laughs> and I say... No. And mind you, the B.O. he had was absolutely <laughs> incredible. He says, get in the ring now. And I said, no. 
So he spat in my face. <laughs> I was spat right. in the face. George the <laughs> animal has <laughs> spat in my face. Wow. I've never been to the wrestling since. <laughs> no. Who was the announcer on the WWF and back in the eighties? The bald guy with the moustache. Oh, yeah. yeah, what was Who his was name? name? Uh, but he says say some, Marvin, say some great. Um, say some great. William Shakespeare couldn't have said it better. Yeah. Uh, great lines. Nah, we'll get know. it. Oh, someone... Mean Gene Overland. Or yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Mean Gene. Mean Gene Oakland. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. right. He was brilliant. Cause he really sold it because he was Ooh. if somebody was having a feud he was really offended on their behalf <laughs> and somebody right. kidnapped the British Bulldogs dog mascot one time mm. and he just dropped the mic and walked off well no that's going too far <laughs> and he just dropped the mic and walked off but some of the great characters the, the killer bees B. Brian Blair and oh, jumping man. Jim Brunzel <laughs> <laughs> great night have you got some news there um, oh yeah and it's one of those stories where I don't really have to do much to it. Okay. Uh, a dwarf performer, this is happening at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival a couple <laughs> a of days ago. A dwarf performer. A dwarf performer. We're out of the blocks. Well, he had to be rushed to hospital after his penis uh, okay. got stuck to a vacuum cleaner. Yep. Right. Was uh, that part of the show? I think, well, it was something, some sort of vacuum cleaner bit that he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> it went horribly awry. Um, the main part of his act was for him to appear on stage with a vacuum cleaner attached to his member with a special apparatus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, the attachment broke before the performance. He tried to fix it using extra strong glue. <laughs> Why would you even get involved with extra strong glue <laughs> when you've got a vacuum cleaner? So he's sitting there going, okay, I'm a dwarf. I've got this bit where I pretend I'm having sex with a vacuum cleaner. Mm. That's not going to make the news anyway. <laughs> and it's broken. If I glue it to myself, That'll it'll, be... it'll never make the odd spots. How this... is glue getting the vacuum cleaner off? <laughs> Put some butter. <laughs> Get, you know, a, I know the jaws of life. And what will remove it? Extra strong glue. Yeah, they don't have any cement. So okay. what happened to uh, it? Well, um, a solid attachment, laughter, mortification, and hospitalisation. Five stars, there the Scotsman. <laughs> You know, you don't want to do that. No. You want to keep the vacuum cleaner away from the genitals. I'm telling you. It's a re- it's a foolish procedure, and you don't want to get involved in it. All me plops! <laughs> live demonstration. The you dangers of live theatre. Neither Ness and Navarra to pull it off. You mm. certainly do. Um, I'm sure they'll love that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, here's something we don't like on this show. Retailers who claim they're crazy... And then turn out not to be. Oh, it, it's a blight. Just bunging it on. Yeah, it's a blight on the bargains they pedal. Bunging it on for the ads, and mm. then once the ad stops, completely normal. Unbelievable. Listen to this. Crazy John does a lot to try and help us out with this. <laughs> Mobile phone king Crazy John has launched a scathing tirade against some of his staff, mm. accusing them of poor sales and inappropriate dress and behaviour. Several people have been sacked. Uh, with Crazy John blasting workers in one store for mucking around and flirting with each other while ignoring customers. Mm. Uh, Emails are going around that reveal Crazy John staff are being regularly monitored by professional mystery shoppers with Crazy himself personally checking the reports. And in a military-style test called D-Day, employees are referred to as soldiers and given 10 minutes' notice to answer 45 questions 100% correctly. Crazy. What are the questions about? Oh, it doesn't say. Probably brain snapping bargains, most of them. <laughs> so that I don't know if that's uh, you know it's being pushed as you know a blight on Crazy John. It's yeah. sort of a negative story, really. Yeah. Mm. I think he's got to turn it into a positive. I agree. Just get some music under this story. That's all it needs. <laughs> Hi, I'm Crazy John, and I've gone completely mad at all of my conveniently located stores. I've launched a scathing tirade against some of my staff for sales inappropriate dress and behaviour. In fact, all of these substandard staff have to go. Yes, due to a shipping error, I'm overstocked with tardy, poorly presented and often unsettlingly flirtatious staff. So out they go with little or no chance of re-employment. Thanks to my crazy mystery shoppers and insane D-Day process, these defective staff members are all out the door in this never-to-be-repeated purge. So remember, I'm Crazy John and my staff have gone completely... No, sorry, that's it. They've gone completely. <laughs> See, now it sounds like a good thing to do. So much better. Quacky music can save anything. <laughs> Speaking of music, Tony. Yes. Uh, you watch MTV a lot. You sure I do. I I'm always in the crib. <laughs> Where else would I be? Dropping it like it's hot. Uh, and you Rich is always also in the crib, yep. popping it like it's hot, sure. as I know. But they're looking for new VJs. Mm. People who st- oh. stand out the front, uh, you know, looking windswept. Oh, yeah. Presenting the Runs House marathons. Oh, you're thinking Rich? No, I'm thinking me. 
Oh really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I'm not. I'm not yeah. a cool man. Well, I wouldn't be described as cool. No. Uh, yeah, and on TV, they can see the range of foodstuffs around you. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> right. And tracksuits don't come up as well as you'd hope uh, on your high glossy television. However, they're no. asking for auditions. Yeah. And Tone, I thought I'd give it a crack. Here we go with my audition for MTV. <laughs> yeah. Hey, y'all. Well, it's been slamming on the jive stick all winter, so now it's time to get out from behind that fringe and throw some colour at it. Electro, dub and free jazz have all got the low hands thumping your Barbie bumps up against the speakers. And who am I to say don't? Not? I'm doing something random at a random party full of randoms. So hit me up on my Facebook's MySpace page. LOL. All oh, spring MTV's playing the things that make you go emo. So keep it locked to MTV and spend your days downloading Fall Out Boy ringtones and your nights watching me and my haircut pretending we know about music. Peace out. Wow. Surely you've got the gig. The phone's ringing now. Oh, my goodness. Oh, hang on. I think it's Crazy John. Oh, no. <laughs> we'll pick up the phone and just hear... Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> we'll know it's him. That's a rich. Get this. It's blown out to two hours, 11 to one weekdays on the Triple M Network.